Yo, what is up, Buffalo Fanatics? It's your boy JTM, man. We are live as promised with my man Doug Worthington. Ohio What's going State. on? What's going on, JT? Thanks for having me, bro. No problem, man. Now, as most most of them know, Doug is from Buffalo, the city, Buffalo's own. Yes, sir. Yes, so, sir. man, tell me, uh, tell me, uh, what the city means to you, man, and growing up in the city and watching the Bills grow up. I mean, as far as Buffalo, New York, in, in general, it's everything. I mean, it's a blue-collar town. I mean, they love their sports. That's what Buffalo Bills mean to me is the fact that you see the dedication and what it means to kind of, you know, go through some tough times. You know, I'm, I was born 87, so that run with the Buffalo Bills, I remember being around my uncles and my dad when they went to the Super Bowl back to back to back to back to back. Uh, playing for the Buffalo Vets is one of the most historic Little League programs, and we actually had the Buffalo Bills decals the Buffalo Bill colors, and we were actually allowed to go to a lot of preseason games growing up. So uh, Buffalo, New York, man, is everything. I went to St. Francis High School after Turner Care where me and you were, were, were at. So just that whole, you know, the growing up, just the aspect of life, man, it, it's a great culture. Uh, like I said, a hard working class city, and it's huge in my uh, development as a man. Like, what does it mean to you? Like, when I, when I look at you and I look at players like Corey Graham and Stanley Means, and you yeah. guys kind of opened this door the next 10, 15 years for other kids take that path. What does it mean to you when you really sit back and think about it? I mean, growing up, uh, again, going to Turner Carroll, man, it goes back to that. Uh, you know, Corey Graham as a leader in the locker room, you know, having only you, – you remember having like 15 players at practice, you know, yeah. times where we were playing against some of the biggest schools in Buffalo, New York, like St. Joe's, and actually defeating those guys. Um, just seeing Corey Graham go to college at New Hampshire, and I actually went to some camps like Syracuse, and the New Hampshire coach was there, and they was asking about me and filling out questionnaires. And, you know, it kind of opened my mind of, you know, high school, yeah, but, you know, I want to go to college. You know, I didn't think I was going to be able to go to, you know, the Ohio State University, but I thought, you know, New Hampshire or going to UB or going to Syracuse would, would, would be a great, you know, monumentous thing for not only me but the city. So, um, you know, Corey Graham still being in the league, man, just won a Super Bowl with Philadelphia. I'm super proud, super geeked of what he's done for the town. You know, um, I played a good six years in the league. I wish I had a little bit longer, but I had a bunch of injuries. But just seeing a guy like Corey Graham when, you know, I played against him when he uh, when they played in, in, in the Redskins. I played for the Redskins. He played for Baltimore. The year they won the Super Bowl then, so I was rooting for Baltimore throughout the rest of the season. I got a bunch of a bunch of friends on Philadelphia. Uh, Chris Long, me and him played together at St. Louis in L.A. Um, uh, Malcolm Jenkins, we came in together at Ohio State. Um, so seeing that run with Philadelphia and the underdogs, and it, it felt like Buffalo. It felt like a town that needed a championship. And for Corey to, you know, be on some of the biggest plays of that game, you know, uh, uh, guarding Gronkowski, a guy who's from Buffalo, New York as well, it kind of brought everything full circle. So it, it meant a lot to me. And it was, uh, it was my, man, I'm happy. I'm super geeked for those guys. I'm geeked for the town. Uh, I'm actually, you know, excited about what's Buffalo going on, what's going on with the you know, Buffalo getting back to the playoffs last year, it was, it was good for me to see that as well. So I know a couple guys on that team, um, a worthy from Michigan State. I followed their, their careers, and I'm just looking for an exciting, exciting year for, uh, for Buffalo. Right, man. Hey, man, it's huge. Like I said, it's huge for seeing what you guys have done. And, it, I mean, I think it's going to save send waves to for years to come, for years to come. Right, I hope so. Man, I hope so, definitely. You know, I, just a little tip. I got a funny uh, Doug Worthington story, man, um, from high school, uh -oh. man. And – uh. I remember Doug. Doug used to hit the sled, man. Coach Rodnecki right. made Doug hit the five man sled, fire off, and Doug would move the whole sled by himself, man. Get us all fired up. So it was huge. Right, man. right. Huge. So man. Yeah. So coming out of high school, man, four star athlete, right? Four star right. recruit, number five rated defense in the country, number two in the state of New York, eighty overall. You had some offers on the table. You go to Ohio State. Yes, sir. Man, how was that? process for you man like for a lot of kids growing up you know again you know looking at a guy like Corey Graham um guys who played before me um sorry I had a phone call Did you get me you back I got you I got you still on yeah uh so so going to um like I said going to you know uh, Turner Carroll a smaller program that uh we went around all the state to, to play football and uh, play against some great opponents, you know, getting all those questionnaires, all those things for different colleges. I remember when uh, Coach Burnett, you know, he was one of those sticklers that he didn't want to give us too much praise because he didn't want us to, you know, kind of have a big head. 
So I had a couple questionnaires. I had questionnaires from like Purdue, um, Temple, I think Syracuse. Just wanted to know about me. Just wanted to da da da. So you know, he was like, "Hey man, you gonna have to earn these. You gonna have to earn these." And I was just thinking like, "Man, I don't know about college football. I don't know if that's gonna be a possibility." That was my freshman year. And again, just seeing other guys go through the program, seeing guys like, um, uh, you know, uh, Dominique Wiggins and Corey Graham and 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 Bell. You know, Bell went to Bethune Cookman. Just seeing those guys get an opportunity to play college ball, you know, it resonated with me and made me work harder. And uh, you know, when Turner Carroll closed, you know, I always said, and 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 I don't think people got the real perspective for it, but it was almost a gift and a curse for me. I said it selfishly because I got an opportunity to play uh, bigger high school football. I got exposed. We went down and played Pennsylvania teams at St. Francis. We went down and actually beat, you know, St. Ignatius uh, up in Cleveland, Ohio, played St. Xavier, and we were ranked 22nd in the country. So it was one of the things for me, I got exposed to the Ohio State. You know, I got exposed for, to, the, to the SEC. I got a bunch of scholarships from them. I got all the Big Ten. I got all types of biggies. So it was one of those things that as time went on, as I developed my craft and I got better, and, you know, God blessed me with a 6'6", six, six, you know, 300-pound frame. Well, actually, back in those days, I was about 250. So he blessed me with an unbelievable size, a great work ethic coming from Buffalo, New York. So uh, being recruited and being able to open the door for some other players to get some 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 way around it. You know, we had a, a guy from Canada who actually heard about my story, and he came down named Ake, Akil Lynch, and he was a running back from Penn State. So he, went, he came from Canada, came down to St. Francis, and uh, that for me was everything. You know, just having a – just having more African Americans go African Americans go to St. Francis was one of my biggest, uh, you know, privileges. It was one of those things that I kind of got tickled about because I know how great of a school it was, but I know how, you know, being in that area, Lackawanna and things of that nature, it was a lot of racism. It was a lot of, you know, unfamiliarity, can't talk, uh, with the community, with the African American community with uh, going to a school like that. My dad went to Timon, and he told me all the things about that in South Park. So I knew it was just one of those things that being able to cross over, go to Turner Carroll, you know, come from the city, Bailey Avenue, Roosevelt, you know, and be able to have some success in a suburban school, I thought it kind of trickled down to the community and other parents was willing to invest and send their kids out there to have a different opportunity. So college was one thing, you know, being able to really produce and, uh, you know, show kids another opportunity when it comes down to high school so they can, you know, maybe explore college was, uh, I think, my biggest feat as, a, as an athlete was just that, that exposure. Okay. To get to Ohio State, man, and you play in yeah. three, three – is it two national championships or three that you played in? Two, man. Two back-to-back national championships, man. Hurt my feelings. We lost to both of them. But, again, it was a, it was a great time uh, going down there with Troy Smith, the Heisman winner. We were wire to wire number one all season. You know, we, we played against uh, the, the biggest game, uh, number one versus number two. Uh, the rivalry game between Michigan was, was, you know, obviously like the playoff before the playoffs to actually be able to go to the national championship in Tempe, Arizona. And uh, we actually, you know, destroyed everybody throughout the season. Had a couple close games. But um, for the most part, again, wire to wire, going down there with Troy Smith, Ted Ginn, um, Quinn Pickock, uh, Roy Hall, you know, just a plethora of guys, uh, Anthony Gonzalez, first rounder, of, uh, so many guys who uh, will go to the NFL and have success. And, uh, you know, we fell short. We got demolished by a, a very, you know, polished and very hungry Urban um, Urban Meyer Florida football team. Um, then the next year I was a starter. You know, we vowed to get back there. We, we bust our tail. We won a Big Ten championship. We again beat our, our rivals, which was a blessing, which is always the number one thing in the season. Um, actually lost, uh, we lost to Illinois uh, and Juice, uh, Juice yeah. and uh, I don't know if you remember, Rashad Mendenhall, yeah. he had a great career yeah. with Pittsburgh, yeah. so he actually came down there and destroyed us, but um, and luckily, man, they, we, we, you know, we played a week before Thanksgiving, and then it was a couple, two more weeks, and we had every team that we needed to fall, fall, and we found ourselves back in the national championship playing against a hungry LSU team. And we played a lot better. Beanie Wells came out there, scored an opening touchdown. Ted Gidd did the same the year before. But we played a little bit better on defense, um, kept the game close. In the third quarter, they opened up and got up, up like 10 points. And then they never looked back, man. They actually uh, they had a, a, a great bunch of guys on those teams. You know, just playing against that, that good brand of football, you know, you look at this, the, the people you were going against, you know, you're going against uh, – you know, Flynn, who's a, a backup quarterback still in the NFL. Um, Glenn Dorsey, who was like a top five pick. 
Um, you know, just a bunch of Florida uh, – Michael Brockers, who's still with the Rams, um, uh, linebacker who I played with. Uh, he's at the Raiders right now. But just a bunch of guy Perry. Um, Perry's still playing with the Raiders. So just a bunch of guys who went off and, and played more football and more ball. You just understand, you know, that, that avenue of uh, just competition, you know, playing at that high level, playing in the national championship. I came, I, I came two, uh, two times short, but, you know, it still was a blessing. I played in five BCS bowl games. The first one I actually tore my ACL at the beginning of the season, so I didn't play in the first uh, Fiesta, bowl, Fiesta Bowl. But then I, I lost another big bowl game my junior year uh, against Texas and, and Colt McCoy. That uh, that team up there, uh, but luckily, man, was blessed to uh, to go ahead and, and win my senior year when I was a captain, uh, and be able to beat Oregon in the Rose Bowl, uh, which was for me the biggest uh, monumentous thing as far as all of my my playing of sports. Just actually having that game come down to the wire, and you know Terrell Pryor, you know, bringing us and, and keeping us the, the victory, and just beating a, a team like that in that atmosphere was a was an unbelievable feat for us. Oh man, huge, huge. So after your senior year, you now you you pretty much won a Big Ten championship every single year. You're a house. Yeah, every year. Mm-hmm. Never lost one. All right. You pretty you won the rivalry game every single year. Every year, yes, sir. So now, so now we go to the NFL draft, right? And your yep. name is called by Pittsburgh. What happens right. there? <clears throat> well, just leading up to that, man. Um, the Rose Bowl. Um, I hurt my calf. The combine, I participated uh, on the bench press. I hurt my uh, my pec. Going to the East West Shrine game, I uh, tore my growing and I hurt my tricep. It was one of those things, man. It kept happening on and off. You know, I was projected to be a four fifth rounder. I got uh, I got drafted a seventh round pick, two forty two to the Pittsburgh Steelers. So honestly, I was in a hotel room, a suite, had my whole family down. It was a very bittersweet thing. It was a uh, it was an opening. It was an eye opener. You know, I I feel like I was entitled. You know, I was I was you know I never I never you know kind of failed. You know, again I lost a couple national championships, but I never failed that I failed anything. I felt like you know it was a team sport. But that time for me was a a growing it was a growing moment for me in my NFL career, the beginning of my NFL career, my 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 life as a man. You know, just kind of you know expecting something and and kind of you know not getting that that uh that recognition that i wanted not getting drafted as early as i wanted so you know when pittsburgh called man i was a little bit upset i kind of wanted to go free agency and kind of go and pick where i wanted to go um uh, being picked so late you know it's one of those things where it's still a long shot just being in the nfl but you know getting drafted at you know 242 when there's like 260 picks i kind of you know I, I got a little bit away from myself and you know just got a little bit upset so again Hindsight 2020, it was a blessing uh, to be able to get drafted, to be able to have that underneath my my title of playing. But uh, you know, again, I was uh, at the moment I was a little bit hurt by it. I was more like, dang, I wish I uh, I wish I got free agency, or I wish I got drafted fourth round, or I wish this, that, and the third happened. But you know, God makes no mistakes, and He put me where He wanted me to be. And it was a, it was a very good lesson, and I got to meet some great people uh, when I got drafted to Pittsburgh, and still have some lifelong friendships. Okay, good man. Like I said, it, it definitely is a blessing. Like you know, um, you had some run running in NFL there. So looking at this Ohio State roster, right? I'm looking at some prospects yeah. here. All right. Right. So for Buffalo alone, I'm I'm seeing a guy Billy Price. I'm seeing a Jerome right. Baker. I'm seeing a Jalen Holmes, a Sam Hubbard, a Ty Quan Lewis, and a Denzel Ward who could all fit holes for this Buffalo Bills team. For sure. One of the prospects that strikes me the most, and especially here in the, re, in the retirement of Richie Incognito about two right. days ago, is Billy Price. Right. Now, Billy was a four-year starter. Yes, he was. Yes, How he was. Not only was Billy a four-year starter, but he played next to a great, you know, center the times he didn't play. He played with uh, – played at Minnesota. What is his name? Eb- it's not Ebner. I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. But he that whole – that whole trenches has been – so solid for for Ohio State. Since I've been there, we had great coaches and Jim Haycock. They they have a D line coach and Larry Johnson who came from Penn State, who is second to none. And I talk about the defense in line because that's who Billy Price is going against every day. You know, they talk about you know Tracy Sprinkle is a guy I feel can fit up there. You guys got Adolphus Washington, who's a guy that I worked out with and mentored uh, while he was at Ohio State. 
you know, so just having that brand of a uh, of competitor, somebody that played at the Big Ten and the trenches like Billy Price, I think it, it speaks it speaks wonders. And I feel like Billy is a guy who you're going to be able to get probably if you move up in the second round or the third round just because he had a little bit of an injury. He had a pec tear, which is very, very minimum in that position because those guys with, you know, being 300-plus pounds, you got all that baby fat there. When you go to the league, you start getting paid to play and you're not going to class, you're doing strictly football, strictly training, those guys are going to be that much more durable. So I'm very excited to see the prospects like Billy Price being able to go, you know, up there, up north, uh, playing that that type of football. Because, you know, Buffalo is some cold football, playing the Jets, playing, um, you know, New England uh, up there in um, Gillette Stadium. You know, it, it calls for some tough people. You know, again, you got a vacation when you go down to Miami to play, but for the most part you're playing in some cold weather. So I think it will be good for a Billy Price you know, to go team up, team up with Adolphus Washington. And as I was growing up, you know, Ashton Yabuti got drafted to Buffalo. Right. Dante Whitner right. got drafted to Buffalo. So uh, they take a great look at Ohio State guys. No one is right in between Cleveland. You know, it's one of those things that, you know, guys can get to Buffalo, get to Columbus, you know, very, very easy. And those ties and, and, and relationships can kind of still stay apart because it is very nice for like a Billy Price during the offseason can go straight down to Columbus, Ohio, you know, work out here at D1 or work out here wherever you want to and uh, be able just to go to Buffalo and just have, you know, just good good lines of communications and, and good travel. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the draft and all all the prospects we got at Ohio State. But I think Billy is a great one to bring up to because I think he's a very physical guy and uh, he'll be good at the guard position. Um, or because I know I think two guys, uh, um, Woods, uh, Eric retired, Woods retired, as well. Eric exactly. Woods retired, he had a neck injury. And uh, incognito. So, yeah, I think he would definitely fit in to one of those guys. And like I said before, he can probably get picked up around the second round just because he's going to be a little bit uh, a little bit cheaper because of his injury. So I think it will work out for Buffalo. Yeah, I mean, like I said, that's one guy I've been targeting. And before the injury at the combine, I was actually targeting him possibly as a pick at 22 um, because, right. like I said, he, he could slide right into center or guard. Right, right, that, right, right. What, that, what pick do you have on second, the second round, do you know? Uh, we have 53 and 56. Yeah, so that's huge. You got those two picks. I mean, I believe that he'd be around probably. He'd still be around. They got a couple guys, interior guys, that's a little bit above him. Um, I don't know. When it comes down to a center, you know, that's a specialty. So they like guys who can kind of play guard and center. So he shows a little bit more, uh, you know, diversity as far as that. But, again, with those two picks, if you guys wanted to slide up a little bit early in the second round and pick them up a little bit early, I think that would be a good go too. So that is also a good point. Another prospect that's really striking me is Jerome Baker. Now me, I I'm I'm a Florida State fan, but I do watch a lot of Ohio yeah. State football. Right, Jerome right. Baker is a very interesting prospect because you cannot teach that athleticism that he has. You're right, hundred percent. I mean, be, having that four five speed and actual game four five speed, you saw the game changer in a Darren Lee and the game changer in a Ryan Sage year. Do you think he could right, possibly right. be in that same mode, especially us having an outside linebacker spot open? I mean, I believe that uh, he's an athlete, like you said before. He's one of those guys that's a football player. Having four or five speed, being very rangy, having long limbs, you know, being an athlete who played in the Big Ten and, and played and dominated, you know, outside of it during the uh, during the bowl games and things of that nature, I feel like he's going to be up there with anybody. And uh, you, those guys have been looking at the Georgia uh, linebackers and the Alabama linebackers, but he's a – I think he's a Florida guy, if I'm not mistaken, uh, a guy with a lot of range, a lot of talent. And he's had a very successful career at Ohio State. You know, I was studying him very closely, and I think he only had one game with a couple hiccups, and that's when Baker Mayfield came up into uh, the shoe uh, with Oklahoma. And he got a kind of, he kind of got beat a little bit, seen a little play action. But uh, he learned from that, and i just seen how much he adapted throughout the season this year, you know, just being more of a commentary role as myself and being able to look at the game a little bit differently. Um, I love his game, and um, I feel like he's one of those guys that could be, you know, gain a little bit of weight, um, and, and the way the league is going right now, like you said, Ryan Shazier, Darren Lee, those guys are still pretty thin. Those guys make a lot of plays. So I still think he'll fill out a little bit more, um, and he can be a, a great addition to those guys. Played actually uh, in um, Washington with London Fletcher, you know, old uh, legend for the yeah. Buffalo Bills. So yeah. London Fletcher and Takeo Spikes, I remember seeing those guys and just understanding what they meant to a, to a defense. So, you know, you pairing him, a young guy like that, with some of the pieces that Buffalo already have. I know they got that great cornerback that they got from the uh, last year, I believe, in the first round who did pretty well. So 
you know, teaming them with some other pieces uh, that Buffalo has, I think it would be good for that, for that defense. Okay. Sam Hubbard, borderline first-round pick. When I look at Sam Hubbard, I, the first thing that stands out to me is 6'5", 270, with decent right. armor. Um, right. Obviously, he played on, a, I would say, probably the best defensive line in the country when you really look at this list. It's not even close. This is the best defensive line in right. the country. Um, Definitely. A lot, of pro, a lot of pro teams are looking at him as a, a keeper, as a steal, yeah. at, at the end of the first round. What do you think right. about Sam? Uh, again, I love Sam. Um, you know, Sam came out of high school as a safety. Sam is a natural, instant guy. He's a ball hawk. He knows to go where, where, where the ball goes, he goes. He's very athletic, man. I mean, I, I think, you know, that in itself is the reason why he stayed on the field. He stayed healthy. You know, he didn't get all the publicity he had. Like you said, he had Jalen Holmes, and they got little – he had Big Bolsa and Nick Bolsa throughout his career. So it's one of those things where he always got second fiddle because, you know, he had the Bolsas around him. Those 97s uh, create havoc, and they, the fans love them, and they, they, they get their just due. But just like last year, Sam had more sacks than uh, than Little Bosa, and uh, he kind of got, you know, passed up on the Big Ten um, defensive player, defensive um, lineman of the year. Um, with Coach Johnson, like I said before, one of the best defensive line coaches in the country, um, you know, taught guys like the Bosas, also taught guys like uh, uh, Talib, Talib um, Halib from uh, Kansas City. He just left. Uh, but he got a plethora of guys who are first-rounders. I think Sam is going to fit right in with those guys. I believe with that 22 pick that you guys got, if you're really trying to, you know, beef up that front and that front four, I think he'll be a great addition uh, to what Buffalo has going on. He can do a lot on the edge. He can play strong side. He can definitely rush the passer. And if he needed to in some packages, he can drop. So he's very versatile. Like I said, playing safety before, you know, he, he doesn't mind getting up there and covering some things in space. Um, but he's a natural pass rusher, and he has a fiery instinct. And I'm excited to see what all my Buckeyes do, especially Sam. Okay. And just speaking of the, the, the D-line, Ty, Jalen Holmes – no, it's not Jalen. Um, Ty, Tyquan Lewis here. He's yeah. one who kind of gets – he gets overlooked a little bit, but a lot of scouts are saying that he may be a better pro than he was a college player. Right. Um. No, I can I can agree upon that. Um. The thing about Tyquan, the thing about, you know, Football in general, you know, you gotta you gotta realize there's a lot of schemes within it. There's a lot of um, you know different things that the guys gotta have to do. One eleventh is a sport, that's a team sport. So one of those things where I feel like when Taekwon gets to be able to really showcase his talent, being able to really show how he can bend the edge and rip and, and kind of be low on the ground and just be an athlete, I feel like he's have a lot of success. He remi- he reminds me of uh, uh, actually a linebacker uh, that I was around in Carolina. And Davis, you know, he's a little bit okay. taller than him, but he's an athlete. He's a hard-nosed player, and he knows football. He's one of those guys that's very good at X and O's when it comes down to actually knowing what everybody needs to do. He's a student of the game. So, uh, Taekwon, he actually was the Big Ten uh, 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 defense alignment of the year, his junior year, and um, got a lot more double teams, got a lot of, uh, you know, running backs chipping him out the backfield. And, uh, again, that full defense alignment, you know, defense line, you know, had a lot of uh, a lot of success, but you know, Taekwon was one of those captains and one of those guys they always leaned on. So, you know, you can say Hubbard, you know, you can say you know Taekwon, and you was about to talk about Jalen Holmes. All those guys are going to have tremendous NFL careers just because they're going to be able to go out there and really showcase their talent. And uh, you're not on scholarship anymore. You got to go out there and make plays. And when you got to go out there and make plays, I think those guys are really going to show that they are very capable of just really finding the money, going to get the ball, getting sacks, and being disruptive in that next level. Now, as a Bills fan, and you grew up in Buffalo like I did, so there's been one gaping hole in Buffalo that has been a huge hole for almost 20 years. The quarterback Tell me about it. I know. The quarterback Now, when I was looking at the list of the quarterbacks that you played with, I've seen, right. I'm sure you've seen different levels of play, different levels of preparation. And I just want to go sure. through this, this list a little bit for people so they understand that your, your knowledge of the quarterback position, okay? Ben Roethlisberger, yep. Josh Bert Freeman, mm-hmm. uh, Phillip Rivers, Robert right. Griffin, Kirk right. Cousins, Jared yeah. Goff, Hayes Keenum, and Nick Foles. Yeah. All great guys. First and foremost, they're all students of the game. Um, I've seen Ben for just a short, brief time. He was actually kind of suspended before the uh, the thing he had, a little altercation he had with the woman. But uh, when he came back, you've seen just the leadership component that he had with the team. 
You've seen what he meant to the guys. You've seen him in the film room. You've seen him in his car. In the, the, the I was trying to be one of those guys that was in the, the facility before anybody. I got there at 6. His car was already there. So it just speaks volumes of what he was trying to accomplish, what he meant to the team. Um, so Ben Robinsberger, again, I got a small snippet of him. I've seen him. No, we lost you for one second. Are we back? Uh, I can hear you. Yep, you were back. Back. I uh, can't see it yet. Yep, there, got you. You're back. All right, cool. Yeah, I just had a phone call come in. But, um, yeah, like I said, uh, I've seen a small snippet of, of um, Ben Roethlisberger. I was actually in camp with San Diego for two weeks. So I saw a small sample size of uh, Phillip Rivers as well. But just understanding that, you know, he commanded the the, the, the locker room. You know, he, he was a country guy. He talked with a twang, and he had fun out there. He was a gunslinger. Practice always was called up by him and broke down by him. So those two guys, Ben and uh, Phillip, you know, only having a short time with those guys, but you've seen what they meant to to a team. Um, I was actually there with, uh, you know, like I said, Robert Griffin came through. Uh, his uh, rookie year was a phenomenal year. It was probably my best year in the league. I played the most that year. We we went to the playoffs um, right. and things of that nature. So, you know, just getting that, being able to, you know, see his maturation, uh, seeing that com the competitive uh, side of him and Kirk Cousins, because, you know, Kirk Cousins was one of those guys. He always told me uh, the cream will always rise to the top. So he realized that he was a talented player in the NFL, and it was just Robert Griffin's time to shine. It was one of those things where they got him a little bit. You know, I was getting him the first two picks. You know, you got to let that man go out there and do his thing, which he did very well. And I'm very excited to see him go to Baltimore and see him continue his career because he's a good man. Uh, but Kurt, you know, how persistent he was. And, and when he had the time to play, uh, when Robert got hurt, he went out there like a true champion, a true general, you know, commanded his huddle. He knew the game. You know, a quarterback position, you got to know what everybody on that offense is doing. And really, you got to know what everybody on the defense is doing as far as the looks and what they're giving you in different pass coverages and whatnot. So, again, a smart, intelligent guy in Kirk Cousins, a very mellow guy, never gets too high, never gets too low. You know, when he when he did that, you like that. You know, you like that. One of those things where I was like, man, I like the fire in him, but I know he's one of those guys that's very, very much, you know, rather give the shine and the light to other people. He's a, go he's a guy that goes out there and just does his job, and uh, he lets all the chips fall where they may. So uh, with that being said, with, with Kurt, with RG3, it was a battle. You know, it was something that I feel like Buffalo uh, should be able to kind of uh, – I know they got the, the backup from uh, Cincinnati, McCown, right? McCown, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so they got him, um, and they're going to actually, I feel like, you know, figure out how to way to grab somebody. I don't know if anybody's going to be available uh, that they won that 22nd pick. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't really feel that the, the, the quarterbacks that they're giving all this love to right now is actually, you know, that great of talent, in my opinion. You know, just looking at, you know, what, what, what uh, my defense did to, you know, Sam Darnold in that, uh, that, uh, that bowl game. You know, right. Ohio State kind of manhandled him. Uh, I've seen the coverages that they kind of, you know, they, they swapped a couple cover two, a lot of man, and they did some other things. And it kind of had, you know, Sam Darnold kind of, you know, up in arms at times. Um, you know, again, Baker Mayfield had his way up in the shoe. I like his fiery aspect of it. I like what he brings to the table. You know, he's a very – he's a competitor. He's loud. You know, again, that can be a gift and a curse depending on if he produces. Because if you produce, everybody's going to back you when it comes down to being loud and being obnoxious and being one of those fire quarterbacks. But if you're loud and you're not getting and winning any games and throwing those touchdown passes, you know, some of those guys in the locker room is not going to really care for your bravado. So that right there in itself would tell on itself later on, you know, throughout the season and be successful or even getting playing time. Um, uh, you talked about Jared Goff, and I love the success that that young man has had. Um, he's one of those guys that fit into that mold. Um, what I mean by that is he's a young guy, he's a young talent, um, you know, he's a California guy as well. He's a West Coast option. He gets the ball out. You know, he throws a great ball. Maybe not the biggest, uh, you know, not a, a, the biggest deep threat, but he's working on that. And uh, being around him for about a year, year and a half, uh, you know, I've seen lights. I've seen some great things from him at times. And then I've seen a lot of rookie mistakes. And, again, that's what Buffalo's going to have to realize, that they're going to have to lean on their defense a little bit more than they might like to. You know, make sure LaShawn McCoy, McCoy gets some uh, get some great help and some great guys up front so he can still do what he does because Shady is still one of the best running backs in the game. He's top five. So one of those things that leaning on Shady, not, you know, putting too much 
emphasis if you guys do get a rookie quarterback in that 22 spot. But uh, hopefully you guys can wait a little bit later and maybe collect some of those picks and maybe get somebody like the Oklahoma State quarterback a Mason little bit Rudolph. later who is still phenomenal um, and has a lot of upside. So, again, if they, if, if, I feel like if, if they have the, the personnel in place that can develop some guys and don't throw them in a the fire quite, you know, quite often, maybe lean on that running back a little bit and things of that nature, I feel like they can go a little bit further and, and later on, you know, being able to have a quarterback for the future. But I don't think you guys – I don't think Buffalo should really, you know, set their eyes on somebody that's going to get them to the mountaintop right away uh, unless they're willing to trade and go and get somebody again, you know, who has more experience. I don't see anybody in the draft right now who's going to be able to kind of pick up, you know, and, and, and kind of get Buffalo over the top. I don't see any Carson Wentz in there or things of that nature. So it'll be fun to see. And last but not least, talking about the last two quarterbacks that you brought up, uh, Carson, uh, not Carson Wentz, but um, Nick Foles. And uh, Case Keenum, man, uh, they are men of God, first and foremost. They are always at the Bible studies. They're always leading the Bible studies. And with that being said, you know, everybody behind them follows those guys, and you respect them. You know, they're married men. You know, they do right by their family. They go into the locker room. They are great pieces in the locker room, and they, they, they know the game. Quarterbacks, you got to know the game. And they one of those guys that got a chip on their shoulders. I know Nick Foles going in there and just doing what he did and winning the Super Bowl. I, I was very pumped for him because I know how hard it was to, to, to go to St. Louis. You know, everybody expect that, you know, with that defense that St. Louis already had, that Nick was the piece to get him over the top. And he had, a, you know, a subpar year. And, uh, you know, you've seen him in the locker room. you kind of seen it on his face. You know, again, we went to Bible study uh, once a week. And, you know, just his mannerisms, just his body language, you kind of felt that, you know, you felt for the guy a little bit. But, uh, you know, again, he came to play every day and work. Uh, and he's one of those guys that, you know, I would love to run my team. Um, Case Keenum as well. One of those guys came from Houston, a lot of passing records, you know, did great things. And, again, was one of those guys that was always in command when it came down to the locker room and what you guys need in a film study. Uh, again, the people around him wasn't as great. They didn't have uh, uh, the, the, the coaches that uh, the golf had now. Um, but, you know, again, they were productive uh, with the Vikings in their respective uh, Philadelphia team. So I feel with Buffalo, if they can get somebody and be able to work with them a little bit and be able to not throw them in a the fire right away, I feel like you guys possibly can find somebody in this draft. But, you know, again, time will tell, and I don't see anybody that I'm just so wild about at the quarterback position, you know, so we'll see. Now, it's funny that you say that about golf in, in, in the RG3 thing because – um. We have picks 12 and 22, and there's rumored that we may be trying to trade up to number two. And you're also oh, wow. saying that – and I, you, obviously you were a part of the Robert Griffin trade, and you were yeah. a part of Jared Goff trade. Yeah. How catastrophic can that be to a team's future by right. mortgaging the house for a quarterback? Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things. If, it, if, if you go out there and you get somebody that you think is your guy and you need him right away, and you have people, you know, in the war rooms and, and you got the GM and the owner, you know, batting a fist for a guy, um, if it works out for you, it can be beautiful. You know, just that rookie year, RG3 was the rookie of the year. Um, he took us to the playoffs. He won the division for the first time in, like, 10 years. So, you know, all was right with uh, Washington. Um, but as time went on, he was getting a lot of – he was getting injured. You know, things didn't, didn't pan out like that. They had to get you – know, they, they, you know, they got rid of him. And it was one of those things where you seen Kirk Cousins come in there, and he did well. He was doing better. And, uh, you know, with a coaching change here and there, and that's always a thing in the NFL, you know, if you don't go to the, to the playoffs, if you don't do what you need to do, if you don't always keep progressing, you know, it's bound to be some changes. So uh, with the changes that RG3 had and bringing in uh, um, and taking out, uh, um, you know, Coach, I uh, can't even think of his name, but uh, our, our, I got his face in my, my head. But, uh, you know, just, just switching up that whole dynamic for that young player. You back? Yep. Okay, yeah. So, again, just switching it up sometimes with players is not always easy. Uh, and going back to the golf trade, uh, one of those things where, again, you know, giving so much for a player like him um, and uh, in the beginning it didn't look that bright. You know, he didn't, he didn't have a great rookie season. You know, a lot of questions came out of there, like, hey, did they do the right thing with all those picks that, you know, they got to give up a first rounder next year and vice versa and things of that nature. But, you know, the production that they had with, you know, changing coaching staff, getting some younger guys, some younger blood, and just, you know, golf emerged as a great quarterback, a top 10 quarterback in the league as far as the stats. So, you know, both tales of the story. You know, you, you might have somebody that come in there and they're really hot at first, 
you know, that wave of RG3 and Kaepernick with the, the read option was very hot for a moment. Then, you know, defensive coordinators put another person in a box, was like, hey, you know, pass it further or, you know, let's see if you can do something with some blitz on you. So it kind of nullified what they could do and kind of made it hard for those guys to be dynamic as they were. So, again, I feel like with the league, you know, you got a, a short window for success when it comes down to gimmicks. Um, if you have a player out there that's going to be able to throw all the balls and be able to kind of be a little bit versatile, I feel like there's a couple guys in the draft that might be able to do that this year. But, uh, you know, betting it all, you know, they, they're experts. They get paid big bucks for it. So it's something that right now, from in my opinion, I don't see anybody that did enough to kind of warrant that in the um, – in the draft this year, but I could be wrong. You know, maybe they see something that I don't. Maybe they see some mechanics that they love. And it's really about giving somebody an opportunity and them being able to have some pieces around them to be successful. You know, when you get, when you grab a quarterback so early and you do a lot for him, you actually give him a lot of confidence. You give him the the, the, the steering wheel to a, to a brand new Cadillac and they got all the chips in the world. All the coaches are going to just kiss up to him and make sure he feels comfortable and, Make sure he doesn't he doesn't get touched in practice, doesn't get you know break too many sweats, and and, and make sure all the, the 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 playbook is is geared for him and that they can kind of you know pick up where he started from and, and talk to his old coordinators and figure out how they can best you know suit him to be successful. So you know again it's a gift and a curse, but you know I feel like if you're going to do it, you know hey do it man and hopefully it, it works out in the end. But you know that's the league, it's life. You know, it's one of those things, go out there and try and shoot for the stars. And, you know, if you don't hit the moon, you know, you still land amongst some some decent some decent company. So I'm looking forward to seeing it. It should be interesting. So I got one question for you, then we're ready, then we'll get ready to wrap it up, man. Sharif Cole wants to know, man, how much is there a difference between Denzel Ward and Marshawn Lattimore? Good question. Ooh, good question. Uh, I feel like Lattimore was maybe a little bit more in your face, a little bit bigger, a little bit, you know, thicker, uh, um, a deep as a back. Um, I do like what War brings to the table. Um, he's a track guy, very fast. Um, he stops on a dime. He, for being a little bit frailer, he's still very physical. Um, you know, Ohio State quietly has been DBU for a long time. You know, they, they've been producing some great defensive backs. Like I said before, Ashley Yabodi, Dante Whitner was up there in you guys' camp for a while. Um, and they just producing, you know, back-to-back -back pro bowlers and, and Roby from Denver, uh, Malcolm Jenkins. So they got a great pedigree, and um, I feel like those guys, you know, it's, it's a new kind of uh, vibe out there, a new wave, a lot, a lot of confidence, a lot of uh, almost flamboyance like Deion Sanders. I know Lattimore had a lot of that. I know Denzel Ward is very sure himself. He knows he can go out there and play. So, you know, you stick him in a place where they have some decent pass rushes. They have, uh, you know, some decent linebackers that can kind of fill some gaps. So, you know, you know, third and eight, it is going to be a pass. It makes it easier for defensive backs knowing that they have to cover just for four seconds or less because if you got those guys out there on the island for longer than that, you know, trouble can happen with those great athletes at wide receiver. So I love Ward. You know, I don't know if he's as physical as Lattimore, but I do think that he's just as good as a cover. I think he has the confidence and the swag you need to play that uh, that position at cornerback because that is one of those positions. you got to have a short-term memory. You can't get too high. You can't get too low. You got to make sure that the next play is the best play, and you got to go out there and compete. I think he's ready. All right, man. So that's answer the question. So, man, I want to take a couple minutes out to say thank you and appreciate the time, man. Like I said, hopefully we have no. you on here again. No problem, brother. I appreciate you, man. Anytime, um, thanks for having me. Yeah, and just talk about your show, the rivalry, man, and uh, your Instagram, your social media. People can reach yeah, out to. Yeah, man, you can you can find me uh, Doug Funny F U N I E on Instagram D O U G F U N I E on Instagram. Um, my rivalry show um, is just about what I love, the passion of college football, the passion of college sports. We talk about everything as far as, you know, the draft, the spring game. We talk about, you know, if players should be paid, you know, just different real topics. Um, and we always, the biggest part of the show is just always comparing that team up north uh, with Michigan, uh, with the team down here at Ohio State in Columbus, Ohio. You know, we've been defeating them and destroying them in every sport. You know, they had a little bit of run in basketball, so they've been hanging their hats on that. But, you know, it's just great football. It's just great talking. You know, it's fun. You know, it's a hobby. It's just something to get out there and just keep me going. I'm done with sports. Sports is done with me. I'm all beat up and bruised. So uh, to be able to go behind the cameras and kind of having a different feel for the game, talking about it in a different light, and just being a spectator has been a blessing. So very, very fun. The rivalry show is on uh, – I, I got actually a packet right here. It's on uh, ES. EBSN, not ESPN, but EBSN. It's an internet radio show. 
And uh, we're on all streams as well. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram Live. So uh, if you guys got some ch- some chance to, to, to hear from the home guy, hometown guy in Buffalo, New York, uh, please check out the show once in a while. I definitely appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Doug, man. Appreciate your time. We'll definitely have you back, man. Thank you, my friend. Let's do it. Have a good all one. Right. All, all right. right. All right. That's it, Buffalo Fanatics. Catch y'all later.